In 1946, at the age of 14, John Roy Robert Searle began his employment as a trainee at the Midland Electricity Board or MEB in Birmingham to become an electrical and electronics fitter. The MEB produced their own permanent magnets to be used in the manufacturing of energy meters and other electrical instruments. This work was carried out in the electronics workshop where Searle was a trainee. Soon, Searle became involved in the production of permanent magnets, and gradually learned the manufacturing procedures and how to use tools and the necessary equipment. Also the management gave him permission to use the research laboratory for his experiments which were considered to be part of his training. It was in this environment Searle began his experimental work on permanent magnets, that eventually culminated with the discovery of a new magnetic effect. Searle's original idea was that free electrons in spinning metal bodies may have a tendency to move in the radial direction due to inertial forces. If this hypothesis was correct then an electric potential difference should develop between the center and periphery of a rotating shaft and between the inner edge and the rim of a slip ring. He also held the view that the electromotive force induced in spinning bodies, due to the Earth's magnetic field could be used for generating electric energy. Accordingly, Searle's first series of experiments consisted of careful measurements on fast rotating steel shafts and slip rings made of brass and indeed he was able to show the existence of a minute electric voltage in the radial direction. If this voltage was due to the inertial properties of the electrons are induced by the magnetic field of the Earth was never established. However, it soon became evident that this simple generator would only be practically useful if means could be found to increase the power output. At this stage in the experimental work, any person with a formal education in electrical engineering would have considered the principle unworkable and the effect an academic curiosity without practical applications. However, Searle was not so easily discouraged and began experiments with rotating permanent magnets manufactured by him using a magnetic material made by Mullard UK, and later using magnetic alloys imported from the USA. These alloys proved to be superior compared with the magnetic material manufactured by Mullard. The use of permanent magnet material resulted in a considerable improvement, and by now Searle was convinced that this simple principle could be used to generate electricity. Whether Searle's choice of magnetic materials was a deliberate experimental strategy or a coincidence is not known, but in due course the use of these materials did lead to unexpected effects. During the early part of his training period Searle manufactured a great number of permanent magnets in the shapes of cylindrical bars, hollow cylinders, annular rings and rectangular rods. The magnets were molded by pressing a mixture of magnetic powder and a bonding agent. For this operation a hydraulic press with appropriate press tools was used. The work was carried out inside a vacuum chamber to prevent explosion. Molds made of Bakelite were also used and the mixture of magnetic powder and binder was packed by hand into the Bakelite mold and the whole assembly placed into the vacuum chamber with the intention of removing the air from the mixture and increasing the mass density of the magnets. However, this method was less efficient than using the hydraulic press which produced better and denser magnets. The curing of the molded cores could sometimes take as long as three days. This suggests that curing took place at room temperature and a liquid binder was used. In later experiments Searle successfully used nylon with an excess of negative charges. These charges appear to have taken an active part in the production of the Searle effect. Two types of magnetic alloys and bonding agents were imported from the USA by Searle. This material was paid by George Haynes of Turner Street, West Bromwich, who financially supported Searle's experimental work between 1946 and 1948, the reason being that Mr. Haynes' son and Searle made the experiments together. A magnet produced in 1946 by a mixture of the two alloys was analyzed qualitatively in 1984 and found to contain the following elements, aluminium, silicon, sulfur, titanium, neodymium, iron. The precautions taken by Searle when handling the highly flammable element neodymium and details concerning the molding process have never been properly investigated. Likewise, the identities of the American suppliers of the magnetic alloys have not yet been established. 
The coil used by Searle to magnetize the molded cores was originally intended for and used to demagnetize turbine shafts and generator shafts and consisted of approximately 200 turns of heavy electric copper wire, normally used for connecting electric cookers to the mains. The magnetizing current used was 180 amperes and supplied by a Westinghouse three-phase mercury rectifier. The on-off switching operation was carried out manually using a high current switch and the on-off duty cycle lasted for seconds rather than fractions of a second. Based on what can only be described as intuition, Searle suggested that a second winding should be added to the existing magnetizing DC coil and connected to an AC source. This proposition created heated discussions amongst his fellow workers as to the effect of such a magnetizing method. The general view was that the magnetic field created by an alternating current would partly cancel the magnetic field created by the direct current and make the coil less efficient. However, Searle suggested that the existing RF signal generator in the laboratory should be used as an AC source, this would prevent cancellation of the DC field. This idea was met with an even greater skepticism as the current supplied by the signal generator would be minute and have insignificant effect on the magnetizing process. Searle persisted, however, with his views and eventually succeeded in winning his manager's approval for the idea. Searle can remember his manager carrying out certain calculations concerning the design of the AC winding. These calculations were at the time beyond Searle's comprehension and no information is any longer available regarding their nature. The exact number of turns in the AC winding remains unknown despite a considerable effort on Searle's part to recall the details concerning the coil. However, based on fundamental electrical engineering it can be assumed that the calculations involved resonance ampere and characteristic impedance determinations with the intention of avoiding shorting out the signal generator. It is, therefore, reasonable to suggest that these calculations can be repeated and a reconstruction of the AC winding can be made. The switching equipment consisted of two hand-operated switches which had been mechanically interlocked, one switch for the DC current and the other switch for the AC current. Exactly when Searle decided to use the roller bearing, geometry as a model for his generators is not known and will require further investigation. However, it must have been very early in his career, probably as early as 1946. The inertial and the gyroscopic effects of a fast-spinning ball race intrigued him and Searle used to release fast-rotating ball races and study their behavior when they dissipated the kinetic energy through collisions with surrounding objects. It was most certainly the result of these experiments that inspired him to use this configuration for his generators. Equipped with these new ideas concerning geometry and magnetizing methods, Searle started to make generators consisting of a single annular ring surrounded by number of rollers. By keeping the ring stationary and forcing the rollers to spin about their own axis and simultaneously revolve around the ring by driving them with an electric motor, the generators produced voltages in excess of 30 kV. However, it was not always that Searle was successful in producing such high voltages. Since he did not know the mechanism responsible for the effect, it was very much a matter of trial and error to reproduce the magnets. Sometimes the failure rate was very high, 70% or more, out of a batch of 100 magnets only 30 would work. The reason for this was never established with certainty, but it is believed to have been caused by the primitive switching equipment used. At a certain critical speed, some of the generators would suddenly lock into a mode of operation that appeared to be some kind of positive feedback and they would run spontaneously without any mechanical connection to the driving motor. In the beginning Searle could not control this effect at all. Later, he found that by loading the generators electrically it was possible to reduce the speed, but once this state of operation had been reached the generators could not be stopped. However, it is possible that if appropriate test equipment had been available Searle would have been able to bring the generators to a halt by loading them either electrically or mechanically. It must be pointed out that Searle did not have the financial support required to carry out such comprehensive and dangerous tests, and even if he had access to the workshops and the laboratory at the MEB, where such tests could have been made, he was certainly not allowed to carry out dangerous experiments on the MEB's premises. 
As the experimental work progressed Searle succeeded in reducing the critical speed to a value close to zero by a careful design and by increasing the number of rollers, and eventually he was able to produce a generator that was self-starting. Searle discovered that when the generators were running the air pressure decreased in the immediate vicinity of and inside the generators. At voltages above 30 kV the air motion was directed away from the rim of the generators, and candlelight that had been placed at the center of the generator ring went out due to lack of oxygen. This decrease of the air pressure could explain the absence of flashover between the ring and the rollers. Searle also discovered that the temperature dropped considerably close to and in the interior of the generators, probably due to the transport of air away from the generator. Another interesting effect was that objects placed inside the generator ring lost their weight. The existence of these effects were later confirmed by use of proper measuring equipment. Three different systems were developed to extract the energy produced by the SEG. The first one is the mechanical system. The details concerning the mechanical drive system are not known and are yet to be investigated. The second is the high voltage system. This system was originally developed for measuring the electric potential difference generated between the stationary ring and the moving rollers. The positive generator terminal was fitted to the ring and the negative terminal consisted of a number of parallel connected comb-shaped electrodes mounted around the generator periphery and in close proximity to the rollers. And the third one is the low voltage system. By fitting a number of stationary C-shaped induction coils around the rim of the generator, and connecting them in series or parallel, or a combination of both. Several small generators of this type were manufactured and by 1952 Searle had built the first multi-ring generator. This device was about 3 feet in diameter and consisted of three segmented rings in the same plane, with a number of induction coils at its periphery. Each ring consisted of a number of magnetic segments with insulating spacers between each such magnet. Due to high cost, this generator did not contain enough roller magnets to be self-starting. The generator was tested by Searle and a friend of his in the open and the armature was set in motion by a small engine. The device produced an unexpectedly high electrostatic potential in the radial direction. At relatively low armature speeds a very high voltage was produced and indicated by static effects on nearby objects. Characteristic crackling and the smell of ozone supported the conclusion. The unexpected then occurred. The generator lifted while still speeding up, broke the union between itself and the engine, and rose to an altitude of about 50 feet. Here it stayed for a while, still speeding up and surrounded itself in a pink halo. This indicated ionization of the air at a much reduced pressure. Another interesting side effect caused local radio receivers to go on of their own accord. This could have been due to ionizing discharge or electromagnetic induction. Finally, the whole generator accelerated at a fantastic rate and is believed to have gone off into space. Since 1952, Searle and his co-workers have manufactured and tested more than 10 generators, the largest being a 10-meter disc-shaped craft.